Suzanne Collins wrote one of the best villain origin stories, and I just saw The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, and I literally cannot stop thinking about it. So today we are going to talk about it. Before we get into it, I want to warn you, this video will have full spoilers for the book and the movie, and it's going to be a bit of a longer one, so grab a snack or a cozy drink and let's get into it. I feel like we have to go through a quick summary about The Hunger Games before we can dive into the prequel, so in case you somehow haven't heard of it. <laughs> the Hunger Games was a best-selling dystopian trilogy, and the first book, The Hunger Games, came out in 2008. The book is set in Panem, which is a futuristic North America, where the country is divided into 12 slash previously 13 <laughs> districts in varying states of poverty and the very wealthy capital, which is controlled by dictator President Snow, who is very relevant <laughs> to this story. Every year, a boy and a girl between the ages of 12 and 18 are randomly selected from each district to compete in a compulsory, televised, battle royale death match called The Hunger Games. The purpose of The Hunger Games is one, to provide entertainment for the capital, which is crazy, and also to remind the districts of the capital's power and to keep the districts in check. The series follows Katniss Everdeen, who ends up becoming the face of the Rebellion, also known as the Girl on Fire and the Mockingjay, which we will get into why that name pisses off Snow so much later on. The Hunger Games trilogy mainly deals with themes of authority, resistance, the effects and origins of war, and the ethics of entertainment. Now, getting into The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. This book was released in 2020, which was almost a decade decade after the end of the Hunger Games trilogy, the books, and many years after the films finished coming out as well. So I think everyone was kind of surprised. <laughs> but it's a prequel about President Snow, set 64 years before the events of the original trilogy. It follows 18-year-old Coriolanus Snow. I, <laughs> I'm gonna try and say that right through the whole video, but in my head I do pronounce it Cornelius, and I know it's not, but we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna do our best. So Coriolanus is mentoring Lucy Gray Baird, who is the female tribute from District 12 in the 10th annual Hunger Games. Music is a very powerful storytelling device in the book and in the film. Lucy Gray is a talented performer that woos the capital and Coriolanus with her songs. The book takes place very soon after the big war with the districts, which we hear referenced a lot in the original trilogy, so we see a much less glamorous capital and a much less powerful snow. The games in this book are not even close to the spectacle that they become in the original trilogy. Dr. Gall, who's the head game maker in this book, is trying to find ways to get people watching, basically, to keep people interested. She succeeds in implementing changes that we see in the future, many of them courtesy of Snow. For example, the betting on tributes, sending gifts into the arena for tributes, turning the tributes into a celebrity of sorts, and interviewing them before they enter the games to kind of build that connection with the audience. Dr. Gall is just a completely unhinged character in this story. Like, she has no redeeming qualities. She has no morality or goodness shown in her at any point. So she's like full evil in this, pretty much. Snow is originally motivated to help Lucy Gray because the best mentor from his class wins a monetary prize and Snow wants to go to university, but his family is no longer very wealthy after the war and he's still trying to convince his classmates that they are. So this prize is very necessary to his future. But throughout the story, Corio and Lucy Gray's relationship develops into a tentative romance, both being somewhat reliant on the other for survival. We spend the entire book in Snow's head, so we see each event and decision that leads him to becoming the tyrant that we know in the future books. Much like Suzanne Collins' other work, this book is divided into three distinct parts and basically three eras of Coriolanus. <laughs> The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes is definitely a more philosophical discussion than The Hunger Games. It deals with themes of nature versus nurture, how far someone is willing to go for power, and what constitutes as love. The ending of this book is left very open with no one truly knowing the fate of Lucy Gray, which does drive me insane, but it signifies how she will haunt Snow for the rest of his life. While her story has all but been erased by the capital, Lucy Gray lives on in her music, much of which we hear Katniss sing 64 years later. So I think the first kind of question everybody has about this is, was it a cash grab? Like, is it a prequel just to, to write something in the Hunger Games universe? And as the big Hunger Games fan that I am, I did not read this <laughs> when it came out because I thought I had no interest in reading a backstory about Snow. I feared it would turn into some sort of redemption story for him and I didn't want that. Next time I'm just gonna trust Suzanne Collins knows what she's doing. <laughs> 
because I finally picked up the book last month and I it's all I can think about. I absolutely devoured it. I think because so many people were worried about it being a cash grab or a redemption arc, it didn't perform quite as well as the other books even though it still did remarkably well. Suzanne Collins says she never wants to go back into the world of Pen M unless she feels like she has something important to say or a story to tell and boy did she have a story to tell <laughs> with this one. I kind of want to start talking about how Lucy Gray differs as a character from Katniss because I think they're kind of automatically compared a lot as the like two female leads of the these respective books. Lucy Gray I think is almost the complete opposite of Katniss. Frances Lawrence who is the director of the Hunger Games, most of the Hunger Games movies and the Battle of Songbirds and Snakes as well. <laughs> the title of that's a mouthful and he's basically described Lucy Gray as like the antithesis to Katniss, which I think is really interesting. Lucy Gray is a performer that is forced to hunt, and Katniss is a hunter that's forced to perform. While Katniss was reluctant to become the face of the rebellion, Lucy Gray relishes in the spotlight. She knows how to manipulate a crowd. Ultimately though, I think they're both survivors, and that's a defining trait that gets them to where they are. Suzanne Collins said, it's Lucy Gray's musical talent that would eventually help in bringing Snow down in the trilogy. Imagine his reaction when Katniss starts singing Deep in the Meadow, written by Lucy Gray, to Rue in the arena. Beyond that, Lucy Gray's legacy is that she introduced entertainment to the Hunger Games. So like I mentioned earlier, this book is quite a change of pace from the original Hunger Games trilogy and I think if you go into it expecting it to move at the speed the Hunger Games trilogy did, you are probably going to be a little bit disappointed. <laughs> it's almost a 500 page book. I have it here somewhere. It's almost a 500 page book and a very small portion of this is the actual Hunger Games. It captures the Hunger Games in its infancy, so it's a much more brutal, less attractive event to the citizens of the capital. Previous years, so like the first to the ninth Hunger Games, released tributes into a small open arena, so it was just like one giant room with like weapons in the middle and that's it. And the games ended within hours because the tributes had nowhere to run or hide, so it was just an immediate endless bloodbath until one victor remains. However, in The Bout of Songbirds and Snakes, a rebel bombing of the arena days before the 10th Hunger Games creates an entirely new environment and one that majorly influences the future Hunger Games that we see. This explosion opened up tunnels, it added rubble, and overall created a more dynamic landscape that led to the games being a multi-day event. We can see the inspiration for the future cornucopia in these games. So in the early years of the Hunger Games, tributes are taken immediately from their districts, they are forced to travel in a train car full of hay and animal feces, and then they're dumped into the monkey cage at the zoo and just left there for citizens to come see them before they fight in the games. So they aren't given any food, they aren't given a change of clothes, they aren't given water, and many of them enter the arena already weak and sick, which kind of contributed to how short <laughs> they were before this. And I think one of the biggest differences from the original trilogy, and I would say the thing that affects the pacing the most, is that this book is from Snow's point of view. So the actual games, like I said, are not a huge plot point because Snow's not in them. He's watching them on a screen. He'll go days without even seeing Lucy Gray because in the book there is cameras only in the main arena, so Snow just doesn't even know she's alive or dead half the time. In the movie, however, they do have cameras in the tunnels and stuff like that, so I think this is where the movie adds a bit more action because it gives us the opportunity to watch the games from Lucy Gray's perspective as well. Since she's the one that's in the games, it creates much more of a sense of urgency than Snow kind of just like sitting in his silent classroom. <laughs> the games end with like half the book still left to go and the rest of it follows Corio as a peacekeeper in District 12, where Lucy Gray has been sent back just to like continue on with her life. Victors weren't given anything for winning at the time, they were just expected to return to their normal lives and try not to be traumatized, I guess. This part of the book really just follows Snow's day-to-day -day life as a peacekeeper, but it's where we really start to see him develop his belief that humanity is innately chaotic and needs to be controlled. While he's in District 12, he writes a letter to Dr. Gall, whom Snow has started to view as a mentor, and remember what we said at the beginning, she is absolutely unhinged, and he writes to her saying, District 12 provides an excellent stage upon which to watch the battle between chaos and control play out. We also immediately start to see cracks in the relationship between Coriolanus and Lucy Gray here because they're no longer dependent on each other for survival. They have fundamentally different beliefs that both of them choose to ignore at first, but we'll get into that in a minute. 
There's this subtle undercurrent of discomfort and violence in the story for the reader and the viewer. It's less in your face than the original trilogy where you're like in the games and in the rebellion first person. I do feel like the pacing was a little bit off in the book where it sometimes felt almost too slow. So I can understand where people felt a little bit more bored maybe reading this book. And it's definitely something that doesn't happen in the movie because it's a 500 page book condensed into two and a half hours and they did change quite a few things specifically about the games, I think to, you know, ironically add entertainment value. <laughs> but there's also some scenes that I would have liked to see from the book in the film that I think has a bit more impact on the future snow that we know. Now one of the big questions in The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, I think, is do Coriolanus and Lucy Gray really love each other? And I think that at one point they both believe that they do, but let's start at the beginning of their relationship. Corio goes out of his way to meet Lucy Gray when she arrives at the capital in an attempt to establish trust with her. He wants her to sing a song in the interview before the games because people were mesmerized by her song at the reaping after she was chosen, and it kind of drew people in the capital to her. Both Corio and Lucy Gray know how to manipulate their charm, which we see instantly in this first meeting. They work together for their mutual benefit. Corio for his financial survival and his secure future, and Lucy Gray for her actual physical survival. <laughs> Lucy Gray says to him, well that's it then. I saved you from the fire. You saved me from the snakes. We're responsible for each other's lives now. Are we? He asked. Sure, she said. You're mine and I'm yours. It's written in the stars. Snow's immediate thought after this is, although he did not believe in celestial writings, she did, and that would be enough to guarantee her loyalty. So I think Coriolanus often sees her as more of a prized possession than a person, something that he's more like infatuated with, the kind of enigma that she is to him. He fights his feelings for Lucy Gray originally because he doesn't see her as an equal. She's district. His thoughts after their first kiss make this perspective very clear, thinking, but Lucy Gray was his tribute, headed into the arena, and even if the circumstances were different, she'd still be a girl from the districts, or at least not capital, a second-class citizen, human but bestial, smart perhaps, but not evolved. Later on, he basically just gaslights himself into thinking she's not really district because the Covey, which is Lucy Gray's family and band back in 12, weren't originally from there. They were kind of just rounded up there by peacekeepers. I think Snow is simultaneously hypnotized by her talent, jealous of her loved ones, and resentful of her confidence and her light and her sense of self. His selfish nature means he's instantly possessive of Lucy Gray, as shown by his thought process after Lucy Gray sang a song about being betrayed by an ex-lover in her interview. His girl Girl, his. Here in the capital, it was a given that Lucy Gray belonged to him, as if she'd had no life before her name was called out at that reaping. Even the sanctimonious Sejanus believed she was something he could trade for. If that wasn't ownership, what was? Although the song had been a clear success, he felt somehow betrayed by it, even humiliated. Here, Snow doesn't even care that Lucy Gray had won over the audience. He wants her to only be thinking of him. In contrast, it's clear Snow's priority was never truly Lucy Gray. He agrees to run away with her near the end of the book because he thought he would be caught and hung once weapons proving he shot the mayor's daughter were found. When he's told he passed the officer's test, which would allow him to move up in the peacekeeper ranks in District 2, his first thought is, oh, how he wished he could go to District 2, which was not really that far from his home in the capital, to elite officer's school, where he would distinguish himself and find a way back to a life worth living. Lucy Gray's views fundamentally challenge Coriolanus's, and she tells him, I think there's a natural goodness built into human beings. You know, when you've stepped across that line into evil, and it's your life's challenge to try and stay on the right side of that line. This goes against everything Snow believes about the natural state of humanity. No thanks to Dr. Gall. Coriolanus then turns on Lucy Gray pretty quickly when he realizes that she's the only one who could stand in his way of getting back to the capital and his chances at presidency. He turns the moment he no longer feels he has her loyalty. I really like this clip of Tom Blythe and Rachel Zegler talking about whether they believe that their two characters truly loved each other. <laughs> I guess, you know what? I, if I had to pick one, I would say they are in love for a, for a short time, um, short but sweet time. But, like, is it love of circumstance? Like, is it, is yeah. it born out of circumstance and out of need for each other? So yeah, I would say yes, but. The first thing that happens between the two of us is the guards say that you want to help me, but you also get money, so mm -hmm. which is it? And I say both. Yeah, yeah, but the reality is that either, both of them are, are very much team self-preservation mm -hmm. and survival. Mm -hmm. So does the book redeem Snow? 
No. Does it create sympathy for him? I would say yes and then no. The book is in Coriolanus's perspective, so it's hard not to fall into rooting for him occasionally. But in the book, you're also very quickly pulled out of that when he says something absolutely unhinged, out of pocket, and you're reminded that he is a classist, narcissistic, selfish man. Like when he was talking to Sejanus about the conditions in District 12 in The Hunger Games, he felt a surge of hatred as he remembered the war, the devastation the rebels had brought to his own life. They lost the war, a war they started. They took that risk and that is the price they pay. This is obviously harder to capture in the film, and I think it's easier to feel sympathetic to part one choreo in the movie, but much like the book, as it goes on, you see him continuously choose to cross the line between good and evil. The actor did such a phenomenal job capturing this through expressions like Corio's selfish thoughts and his obsession and his distrust and then Lucy Gray's eventual distrust of him. I think certain behavior at first can almost be excused as a traumatized and misguided kid that grew up in this war-torn discriminatory city, lost his father at a young age, through the war in the districts, but his actions get progressively more sinister and power hungry throughout the story. In the book, we're constantly reminded <laughs> how far above everyone else Snow thinks he is. He's so dramatic about having to dig up a worm to fish his thoughts are, this was his life now. Digging for worms and being at the mercy of the weather. Elemental, like an animal. He knew this would be easier if he wasn't such an exceptional person. The best and brightest humanity had to offer. Like... He actually just thinks like that. It's it's crazy. And it's not something that develops throughout the story. Like, this is something that Snow starts the book with, this superiority complex. The ending of this story genuinely makes me feel sick. Like, you really see the last bit of humanity leave him in the woods with Lucy Gray. The moment he decides that he will do whatever it takes, get rid of anything or anyone in his way, to reach ultimate control and power. His behavior in the last part, I think, is what makes him truly scary. The final scene with Lucy Gray has such dark, sinister undertones before the tension boils to the surface and results in him hunting her through the woods with a gun. So, if we're not supposed to feel sympathy for him, why is he hot? I mean, this is objective, obviously, but like, I mean, I think it's clear <laughs> in both this younger version of Snow and President Snow that we know in the Hunger Games trilogy that he is charming and manipulative, and he always has been, something that his looks only help. He's very good at presenting as compassionate and caring, even though inside he's just thinking about how much he hates someone. And it's dangerous to assume someone's innocence because they're conventionally attractive. So how do we get from part one choreo, caring cousin, dedicated student, scared teenager, to part three, a man who is very close to the President Snow from the original trilogy? The three parts of the book and the film are the mentor, the prize, and the peacekeeper. But I think this could also be divided into choreo, Coriolanus, and President Snow, as each part takes us closer to who he becomes. Suzanne Collins mentioned being inspired by Locke's theory of tabula rasa, which theorizes that everyone is a product of their experiences. Snow's authoritarian convictions grew out of the experiences of his childhood, as did his complicated relationships with Mockingjays, food, the Hunger Games, District 12, and women. So you rewind and plant the seeds. She also references Wordsworth's line, the child is the father of the man from the poem, My Heart Leaps Up. This term essentially means that the behavior and activities from a person's childhood go a long way in building their personality. The role of parents and teachers is vital to building a person's identity. Collins said the groundwork for the aging President Snow of the trilogy was laid in childhood. Now, Dr. Gull acts as the mentor and the parental figure for Coriolanus, therefore playing a big role in shaping his worldview. She sends him into the arena during the games just as like a lesson, saying, that's humanity undressed, the tributes and you too, how quickly civilization disappears, all your fine manners, education, family background, everything you pride yourself on, stripped away in the blink of an eye, revealing everything you actually are, a boy with a club who beats another boy to death. That's mankind in its natural state. While Corio kind of laughs this off at first, he quickly adopts this philosophy as an explanation for the world and also for his continuous predisposition to violent outbursts. My foot is so asleep. Then in class, Dr. Gall asks him what their strategy is if the war cannot be won. Corio answers, we control it. If the war is impossible to end, then we have to control it indefinitely, just as we do now, with the peacekeepers occupying the districts with strict laws and with reminders of who's in charge, like the Hunger Games. In any scenario, it's preferable to have the upper hand, to be the victor rather than the defeated. Sejanus, who acts as a conscience or kind of angel on his shoulder throughout 
the story answers, though in our case decidedly less moral. Corio doesn't fight him on this here, but as the book goes on, Coriolanus has less and less patience and space to hear Sejanus's objections to the way the capital operates. He takes a dark turn in the final part when he doesn't get what he thought he deserved and is instead sent to District 12 as a peacekeeper. Coriolanus buried his face in his hands, the capital making a mockery of the snow name. Was this the fate of the magnificent snow family? And what of him, Coriolanus Snow, future president of Panem? His life, tragic and pointless, unspooled before him. This man is so dramatic for no reason. It's here that Coriolanus grows tired of being Sejanus's keeper, feeling threatened by his refusal to excel on behalf of the capital. This ultimately fuels his decision to turn in Sejanus to Dr. Gall, leading to Sejanus's execution. I think this, along with that final scene with Lucy Gray, is where we see him truly step into the persona of President Snow. While Coriolanus is distraught by the punishment enacted on Sejanus, he never feels remorseful. He responds similarly to Lucy Gray betraying him, aka like being upset that he was responsible for Sejanus' death. He's disappointed by how things turn out with Lucy Gray, but he feels no guilt, only self-pity. In his mind, he did what he had to do. We see him rapidly devolve into violence as self-preservation kicks in and he decides he must take out Lucy Gray to ensure there are no loose ends that threaten his future. This part of the scene in the woods is where I felt like such strong like discomfort and anxiety when he looked down at the gun in his hands. Maybe he should have left it in the shed. It looked bad coming after her armed, as if he was hunting her, but he wasn't really going to kill her. Just talk to her and make sure she saw sense. So clearly that changed rapidly. And then Lucy Gray in a final stance before vanishing off the face of the earth uses music and mocking jays against him, both things he believe represent disarray and defiance. He hated mocking jays from the second he saw them. The woods exploded, every bird of every kind screaming its head off while the mocking jays continued their rendition of the hanging tree. Nature gone mad, genes gone bad chaos. When Snow returns to the capital at the end to study under Dr. Gall, he is relieved to find out all evidence of the 10th Hunger Games have been erased. He wanted any reminder of Lucy Gray gone, thinking she and her Mockingjays could never harm him again. Little did he know. I really like one of the final scenes in the film that I think really captures this transition. It's an interaction between Coriolanus and his cousin Tigris, who, much like Sejanus, has acted as a conscience and a possibility of a path to good for Snow throughout the story. And it's something that we never really get closure on in the book. There's no kind of final interaction between Tigris and Coriolanus. And, you know, I would love to know more about what happens to Tigris because when we see her in Mockingjay, she's different. She looks very different. <laughs> and she seems like she's been through it. So I'm very curious to know her story. In the scene, and I'll insert a clip if I can find it, but he asks her how he looks in his new uniform and Tigris answers, I think you look just like your father, Coriolanus. What do you think? I think you look just like your father, Coriolanus. Snow immediately clocks that as an insult. One, because he knows she never liked his father. His father was a very angry man. And this is also the first time that she's ever called him by his full name and not his nickname, Corio. And to me, this represents the death of the scared, hungry, innocent-ish teenager Corio and the birth of the powerful dictator, President Snow. So I really enjoyed kind of diving into the story and the themes and the characters and figuring out how we get from here to the Hunger Games 64 years later. <laughs> Let me know if you enjoyed this video. You can subscribe down below. I make a bunch of different bookish content and occasionally little deep dives into something book related <laughs> like this. And if you made it this far, please leave a comment letting me know and I will hopefully see you in the next one. Bye.